questions. Good morning, everybody. Just giving Zoom uh, another 30 seconds or so to get everybody into the room and then we'll start. Thank you. Hi everyone, just giving Zoom just a few more moments to uh, let everybody into the room and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, hopefully uh, Zoom has had an opportunity to get everybody into the room. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on COVID-19. Haven't said that in a while. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications. COVID cases and hospitalizations rose in August, albeit in a mostly vac vaccinated population that limited the scope and impact of the increase. Another round of boosters is on the way, but there are also new variants to contend with. We have two Duke experts with us today to discuss the current conditions and what to watch for as we approach fall and winter. With us this morning is David Montefiore. He is a professor and director of the Laboratory for AIDS Vaccine Research and Development at Duke University Medical Center, where for the past three years, he has also studied the emerging strains of COVID-19. Also joining us is Cam Wolf. He is an infectious disease specialist at Duke Health and an associate professor at the School of Medicine, where he studies infectious diseases and biological and emergency preparedness for hospital systems. Good morning to you both. Dr. Wolf, um, can you start us off by telling us what kind of case numbers you've been seeing through this summer and, and how severe the illness has been in those patients? Yeah, thanks, Greg, and thanks for putting this on. Um, you know, to your point, I think we've had a sort of a, a steady increase since probably the middle of July, in actual fact, was when we started seeing it. And to put that in context, that that's the same as what we've seen in a timeline point of view as the last three years of the pandemic. We've always had this sort of late July, August, September spike. Um, but to put numbers around that, you know, our, our lowest point almost at any point in the pandemic was probably May and June when we were down to an average census across our you know, 1200 bed hospital of maybe 10 to 15 patients. Um, by comparison, we're now sort of sitting around 50 to 55 inpatients who have COVID. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a sort of a, th a three to four fold increase. Um, we also see that in terms of patients who are presenting to the healthcare system, maybe they don't get admitted, but perhaps they've made it to an urgent care or an emergency room. And those numbers are similarly up, you know, again, to put figures around it, we would have typically seen an average of about 20 positive cases somewhere in the system per day. Um, in May and June, that's now up to sort of more like 90 to 100. Uh, so you see a, a larger groundswell of people who are positive, fortunately not needing the hospital, um, but some spilling over to still need the hospital again, three to four times more. For the most part, the hospitalized patients fortunately have not been so sick as to need intensive care like was sadly much more common in 2020 and 2021. So we only have three or four, depending on the day, in the ICUs here at Duke at the moment. Um, that would be sort of maybe a third of what we used to see proportionally. Uh, so we've got a, a larger burden of illness in general. Um, sorry for my screen free. But um, but maybe an edge off the most severe end of the spectrum. Um, and if you want, we could sort of go into the, the way that those patients are presenting is a little different than what we used to see. Absolutely. We will come back to that. For now, I'd uh, just like to bring in Dr. Montefiore. Um, it's been reported that the recent case increase has resulted from a variant known as EG5. What do we know about that variant and how has it fueled the climbing case numbers that Dr. Wolf was just talking about? Right. So. Um, we're no longer in a period of, of this uh, pandemic um, where we have a single dominant variant that's circulating. Um, rather, for some time now, we've had multiple variants that are circulating. And, and right now, a lot of them belong to the XBB lineage. And all of those are very similar in their immune evasion properties. And the vaccines are holding up very well against them. But now we also have EG5, which is somewhat different from the XBB variants. It's picked up another key mutation in its spike protein that makes it somewhat less uh, uh, susceptible to um, neutralizing antibodies, which is what people 
uh, rely on to um, measure how effective or predict how effective the vaccines will be. And this EG5 variant is about two times less susceptible uh, than the XBBs. Uh, but what we have found recently is that the updated uh, booster that will be uh, rolled out this fall is uh, still generating very high titers of these neutralizing antibodies against EG5. So there's very little concern uh, about uh, that variant as far as the vaccines go. The vaccines are expected to remain very effective against it. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Montefiore. Thank you both for those opening comments. We'll open it up to questions now. Thanks to everybody who submitted questions in advance. You can also post questions via the Q&A window at any time. If you'd like to ask a question in person, raise your hand in Zoom and we will unmute you when your turn comes around. And if you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Dr. Wolf, I'd like to come back to you and the comment you made about what was different um, in some of the cases you've seen. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how much of it was people with um, existing vulnerabilities from other conditions or people who were unvaccinated and what the makeup of patients was like yeah no it's an important question so you know i think really since the start of the omicron wave we've seen a lot a, a proportion of all hospitalized patients with somewhat incidental covid that continues to be the case that's about a third of the admissions that we would see where they test positive but have no discernible symptoms that proportion kind of hasn't really changed but there's a great there are a number of people who are symptomatic and so i i would say that the reassuring part to start with aligned with our reduction in ICU admissions is that there is a, a it's now fortunately very infrequent to see the really hyper inflammatory kinds of pneumonia that we used to see frequently in 2020 and 2021. They still occur, but they are rare. And I think most of that can be attributable reassuringly to both vaccinations and native immunity or both from infection. That doesn't mean, however, that for people who are at high risk of respiratory illness in general, um, that a bad case of, of, a, of a viral illness can't tip over many of their other comorbidities. So I think for the majority of people who we still see, they, they fall into one of two categories. They're either high risk through comorbidity or age or both. So maybe they already have some emphysema, high risk heart disease, uh, perhaps they're over 75 or 85. And, and the viral pneumonia that they get from COVID is in itself enough to perhaps turn them off their fluid for a period of time and they come in with dehydration, accelerate their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. They're here with COVID symptoms, but it's driven an admission fundamentally for something else. The second group remain complex and that's patients who are immunosuppressed. Uh, and those folk, unfortunately, are making still a, a steadily increasingly large proportion of patients, and they get hit with a sort of a double whammy. First of all, because of their immunosuppression, say transplantation or chemotherapy, um, they're not able to respond to their vaccine or develop immunity from previous infections as efficiently as, as healthy adults. So each COVID episode is sort of like another new go around. They find it harder to clear their virus. They often have these sort of waxing and waning, relapsing courses. Uh, and secondly, they're often on immunosuppression medicines or transplanted or chemotherapy because they have other underlying risk factors that COVID can sort of tip over and unstabilize. So those patients continue to pose, um, uh, COVID continues to pose them a lot of problems and, and they're seen disproportionately actually these days in our hospital numbers. I wouldn't say that there's been anything that's been unique in terms of clinical presentation in the hospital for EG5 uh, so far, or in fact, any of the XBB lineage for that matter. Um, but I do think we're continuing to see that drift towards at-risk adults um, being disproportionately represented uh, in our population. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. And there's more I want to dig into there, but I want to come back to David Montefiore again. Dr. Montefiore, if you wouldn't mind, can you talk a little bit about this uh, other variant of concern, BA28.6, uh, which has been reported to be quite adept at getting people sick? How many cases of that strain are out there and what do we know about it at this point? Yeah, well, it's been found in multiple countries and, and it's been found in multiple locations in the United States. Um, it's not real prevalent as far as the um, genetic surveillance data show, but uh, that could be an underestimate because there's not nearly as much genetic surveillance going on now than uh, earlier on in, in the pandemic. So uh, we really don't have a, a good idea of how widespread it is. Um, but as far as um, the, the data that are coming in, it's still relatively rare. 
What scientists are concerned about, though, is that this variant, BA2.86, differs from all of the previous variants um, by, you know, about the same extent that Omicron uh, was different from earlier variants. So it's a, a major leap in terms of the number of additional mutations that it has in its spike protein. Um, and what scientists pay most attention to are mutations in the receptor binding domain, domain of the spike protein, because that's where most neutralizing antibodies attack the virus. Um, when BA2.86 was identified, first identified last month, uh, scientists were alarmed by this large number of mutations in its receptor binding domain. There were 26 of them in total, and eight of them had never been seen in any other major variant. So this was, again, very reminiscent of when Omicron first appeared, and it raised concerns about the potential of BA2.86 to further evade immunity. And then on top of that, um, before there, were any, uh, there was any experimental data available, scientists uh, use computational models uh, to predict um, how uh, likely it is that this virus would evade immunity. And those predictions uh, were um, pretty dire. They indicated that this virus could be 10 times um, um, uh, more evasive than the currently uh, circulating variants. But just in the past few days, uh, several uh, groups have reported uh, data, actual experimental data, looking at how sensitive this virus is to the neutralizing antibodies that people have from vaccination and infection and a combination of the two. And what they're finding is that BA2.86 is only slightly more uh, evasive than the currently circulating variants. And so that's really good news. And scientists expect that the updated booster, which is a closer match to that variant than any of the other uh, boosters that, that we've had will remain highly effective uh, against that variant and all of the currently circulating variants. So that's, that's good news. It was really a relief to see those data come out. Uh, now, um, next week, there will be data uh, from uh, people who received the updated booster that will be available this fall. Uh, and those will be very telling uh, data as well. I anticipate that um, they'll show that there's a, a very good response uh, to, to this variant. So, uh, but again, we have to wait uh, and, and, until those uh, data are available and see what they look like. And um, again, they'll, they'll be uh, available early next week. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and on the subject of the upcoming booster, Dr. Wolf, what could you tell us about when people can expect that to be available and how important it is for people to go out and get boosted? Yeah, well, I wish I had perfect visibility of the exact day that it would hit the shelves. I don't. Um, you know, the predictions both from, uh, from, from the companies, at least, would be mid to late September. It obviously still needs to go through an FDA and a CDC ACIP panel approval first, although I don't foresee any uh, reasons why they would provide hurdles, but they'll give us guidance as to how, how those bodies would view the way that we should roll this vaccine out. So I, I suspect, you know, by the, certainly by the end of September, if not early October, uh, they'll be available both in local pharmacies and through healthcare institutions like Duke. You know, I think in terms of importance, David hit on a couple of points there to say, look, all of our evidence so far points to the modified XBB variant vaccine being um, likely effective at, at further reducing your chance of getting COVID. And, you know, we, although we've always played like influenza, a little bit of a catch up to match vaccines to circulating variants, I, I think so far what we see on the horizon is, is to me at least reassuring that that will be a good um, and appropriate boost to your question about whether we should go ahead and, and be recommending it to patients, um, you know, without getting ahead of the FDA or, or CDC, I think there's a couple of big things that really move me towards saying yes. Number one, we still see COVID. And if you use today's sort of at the moment's late summer spike as a prediction of what may be to come, we've typically seen a larger spike occurring through December, January, February. And I don't currently see any reason why that would not be the case here. I think you'd be brave to predict against that. So the timing of this release is actually really helpful. You know, we know it takes a good few weeks to develop full sort of antibody related immunity. And so getting patients the chance through October into November of getting vaccinated like we do with flu season actually uh, would be advantageous for the arrival of those waves in the winter. 
you know, we do have good data now to support the fact that when co-administered with influenza vaccines, that's safe and, and, and equally immunogenic, you don't lose um, sort of benefit of either one. So I think you get a logistic advantage of being able to offer patients who are at high risk of one virus, they're going to be at high risk of both, the same opportunity to do vac both vaccines at the same time. And, you know, I think the other we often get a little um, sort of tied up as to whether a particular vaccine is an exact match for a variant. I, I, you know, the other thing to remember is that I think this is a this is a, a rising of all ships sort of argument to me, where the overall increase in our antibody titers that respond to a vaccine have been seen to be quite substantial, and 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 when we look at how that's affected current variants, quite impactful. So, I, you know, for high risk adults, many of whom sadly in the U.S. chose. Uh, you know, did not take the path of taking the first bivalent booster that's been available for the last 12 months. They are probably well more than a year down the road from the last uh, vaccine that they would have had. I think that's a good call to move forward and, and try and um, actually project these people to get the vaccine. Similarly, if you were infected with COVID, you know, a year ago, even nine to nine to 12 months ago, you know, this, these variants that we've just described have drifted a long way from the immunity that you would have gained from, from those early variants. Again, another call to, uh, to try and increase your protection. Absolutely. Thank you. And we have a related question uh, that's been posed in the, the q and I'd like to ask you about that says, with the newest booster being the first one that will not be universally free from the federal government, how concerned are you about a two class problem where people with health insurance can get the vaccine while those without cannot and of course how could that kind of impact society more broadly from a public health perspective if there are people who can't access the uh, the booster that want it no i think that's a, a really great question that's always a concern frankly and extends beyond vaccines to how we administer health advice and health uh, counseling and health care to you know wide across the spectrum of our society but i think you're right to the to the question is uh to the you know person who asked the question to be cautious of that you know I, we are trying already to think through that by trying to make sure that we think about ways of getting vaccine into spaces where some of our more marginalized and and uninsured individuals live and encounter healthcare. and i think that's part of the aim here i think the other part will be to message this really clearly to say you know there have been offers put forward by the federal government and and the companies to say look we we don't want anyone left behind in this situation financially that remains to be seen i think how that actually plays out and i think the you know that does bother me that there's a risk here that neither the message of vaccination will get to people who maybe don't have the same health connections that some of us on this call would have but also then the access becomes restricted and 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 that's a risk we're absolutely going to try and have to think through very carefully. I don't have the perfect answer for it yet. It needs to be seen. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And if there's anything we've learned from the last three years is that there don't seem to be perfect answers for all of these questions. Um, Dr. Well, not, only, not, only, not only not perfect answers, but we have also learned that the that there is an unfortunate association with health literacy, insurance, financial capability, and worse COVID outcomes. And, you know, I think you'd be foolish to predict that that associate misassociation will not continue to be the case, which should be a call for all of us to be, in fact, more proactive towards getting a vaccine message to the people who are going to need it the most. They are often the people who are uninsured. Absolutely. And thank you very much for emphasizing that. Dr. Montefiore, uh, Dr. Wolf just mentioned about, you know, what we can expect um, uh, or that it would be foolish to bet against, you know, another increase in the fall and winter. Um, what can we say about fall and winter based on our experience of the last three years and what we know about how the virus has mutated so far? Does that, how confident does that allow us to be about predicting what cases might look like over the winter? Well, one thing that we've learned over the past three and a half years is that this virus isn't a seasonal virus like the flu is. Um, it's with us constantly. And as immunity wanes in the population, we're going to continue to see increased numbers of infections and associated increases in hospitalizations and, and deaths. Um, the you know, current CDC statistics show that only 17% of eligible Americans got the bivalent booster. So going back to some of the comments that Dr. Wolf made earlier, um, I, I think this is one of the biggest concerns that we have. You know, the fact of the matter is that most of the people uh, in the United States and other parts of the world haven't been boosted now for over a year. And we know that immunity uh, to this virus wanes over time. 
And so the best thing that people can do to maintain a normal uh, way of life is to continue to get their uh, booster shots. And the nice thing is that the booster shots are working. The updating is improving how well they work. Um, and so, you know, so far, um, the strategy of vaccinating has been uh, very effective and updated, you know, updated boosters have, have uh, been very effective. So that's good news. What we really need are more people to take advantage of that. Sure, thank you. And on that subject, would you expect, based on the experience of the last three and a half years, that we should expect annual boosters for a while or in perpetuity? Or is it something that you do think, you know, that think is, is going to be a temporary thing? Can we say that yet? No, we can't. It's very hard to predict. Uh, again, we're still very early in our experience with this virus. It's only been about three and a half years. Um, but what we have seen is that it's persistent. It's It's always with us. Um, and so it is very likely that it will continue to be with us uh, for a very long time. And, um, and I expect that we'll continue to see updated vaccines every year, uh, like we see for uh, flu. Um, but again, you know, remember, remembering that this isn't a seasonal virus, uh, I think we can continue uh, to expect to see uh, increases in infection rates and hospitalizations and deaths periodically throughout the year. Um, and not, you know, uh, the same time of year necessarily because of waning immunity and because the virus is, uh, we expect it to continue to evolve and just gradually become less and less susceptible to the immunity that was built up by previous uh, boosters and, and infections. Um, and we're going to have to continue to get these booster shots uh, if, if we're going to uh, be able to contain this virus um, to any great extent. Yeah, Absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd love to add to David's point there, which I think is spot on, but from a clinical point of view, we have 55 people in the hospital a day, many, if not all of whom could have been avoided if we try and maintain their immunity. We still see people who die of COVID. This is still orders of magnitude larger than flu. And we should view that as unacceptable. I don't, I don't see any way around how that is an acceptable position where we sort of, we say, oh, it's less than what it was 18 months ago. That, that doesn't mean this is not highly impactful. That doesn't mean people still don't get long COVID. That doesn't mean there's not interruptions to work and scheduling and life and family illness and all of the rest. And if vaccines are a pathway to try and avoid that, and we happily for many decades have accepted that that is a truism for influenza, how, how do we not view COVID through the same lens? Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, and Dr. Wolf, on a related subject, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, COVID reinfections. How common are you seeing those? And can you talk about why reinfection is still an undesirable outcome, even if somebody had COVID before and didn't get particularly sick? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll start by saying it, it's a little bit harder to know when people are reinfected. Um, you know, we, we, we used to have much more granular data on that when every single person's infection was be, would be required reporting and you could sort of more accurately track it. Now with the advent of lots of home rapid tests, um, which are quite effective still at detecting COVID and with the recognition that we don't need to report everything, there's undoubtedly more reinfections going on that we don't know about. Uh, you know, this this begins as a conversation that reflects back to some of David's earlier points about sort of modifying immunity. We've recognized for quite some time that, you know, your immunity gained against prior strains drifts as vaccine, as virus evolution moves away from the antibodies that you made. So it's not a surprise that we can sadly get reinfected. It does tend to be generalizingly so that the for, for a couple of reasons that the cases of reinfection tend to be a little less severe in general. Uh, you retain some memory of the prior infections, which I think has been shown to be reducing your risk of really bad hyperinflammatory pneumonias that we used to see. Um, and secondly, there may be some element of drift in terms of sort of viral pathogenicity over the last three or four years that has aided that too. So we, I, I would say it's uncommon these days to meet someone who's reinfected, who gets a worse clinical course than what they may have had in the outset. That is not an absolute rule, however, because I think the other thing that factors into how bad your disease is when you get COVID is what else is going on with your health. And we have plenty of people who 
you know, may have tolerated COVID well the first time, but in the interim have developed um, some renal disease or may have had a stroke or a heart disease. Uh, and, and that plus their reinfection of COVID is enough to tip them into much more critical illness. So whilst it occurs and it's difficult to measure the frequency of that, um, and it's generally less severe, I, I, I'm cautious to be sort of cavalier about reinfections and their risk because we do see some people who still get um, quite severe illness and hospitalization and uh, and I remain uh, unable to predict who is left with long COVID symptoms and that is not something I wish on anyone frankly I've had colleagues you know who very high functioning colleagues who've had to move out of medicine because of long COVID symptoms uh, and, and that's just not something that anyone no, absolutely not. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the questions coming into the Q&A, trying to get to as many of them as we can. We also have um, uh, a raised hand uh, in the chat. Michael McElroy, uh, you should uh, be able to be unmuted now. Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, great. Thank you uh, so much. Um, so the question is for the people, um, just like the most people, given the state of the current numbers, are, have the lessons from the past three years, will they serve them and how to go about managing their own risks? Are masks necessary? Um, uh, do stay at home tests, are they still uh, a good thing to move? Like what is the current state of just the average approach for people without comorbidities? Uh, what's the guidance today? Do the lessons of the last three years still serve? Let me take ahead, Cam. Cam. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, that's a great question. It, look, I think mainly the lessons are, are, are well held through the last few years for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, we have a far better understanding of how COVID transmits. You think back to 2020, we struggled to under, understand really that this was predominantly aerosol transmitted, not touch surfaces. We understand better about the dynamics of people moving in large cohorts, indoors versus outdoors. Um, you know, that sort of viral transmission dynamics is well understood and there's nothing different that's occurring here that I've seen in terms of new variants that would alter that. Number two, um, we have a good sense of what your symptoms can be. You know, I think for the last three years, we struggled to elucidate to many low risk people that in fact their allergies or their mild cold-like symptoms could in fact be mild COVID in their situation and yet could be much more significant COVID if transmitted to someone else. That sh I hope is now um, more widely recognized. You know, if you recognize your symptoms, as you say, we now have an availability of home-based tests and reassuringly so far, um, at least EG5, and I'm told also 2.86, although David, correct me if I'm mistaken here, um, are detected with the same um, uh, relative ease through rapid home testing that have previous variants uh, also been so. So we have a liberal availability of mechanisms for people to know that they're COVID positive. And at the end of the day, if anyone does have any high risk characteristics, we, we have medicines um, available. They're now widely disseminated. We don't have the shortfalls that we had through much of 2022 and they work. So all the mutations that we've talked about in terms of um, variant drift have not had an impact reassuringly on um, the efficacy of drugs like Paxlovid or heaven forbid remdesivir for people who are more sick or molnupiravir for that matter. So, you know, there's a second part of your question, which is, should those lessons have really sunk into the community? Um, that That is harder to know and probably has sunk into certain segments of the community better than others. But, you know, there's not many families these days who haven't had direct impact or, heaven forbid, mortality associated with COVID impact. So I would like to think that for those families, they have a good understanding of who amongst their friends, families and work colleagues are high risk. They have a better understanding of what the symptoms are. They're probably no different at the moment. And they have that pathway towards recognizing their test and getting themselves isolated, better entrenched in their mind. Is there, if there's a risk, I think it's complacency, frankly. Um, you know, part of that's the reason for these uh, for these sessions is to make people aware that this has not gone away and we still see a threefold increase in hospitalizations. Um, but the lessons should be the same, if that answers the question. So I would just add to that, um, that, um, you know, it's important to uh, let the community know when there are uh, increases in um, the infection rates and, and hospitalizations and deaths, because there's always going to be a certain segment of the population who's going to take that to heart, and they're going to be more careful. 
Uh, I've seen more people wearing masks recently. Um, they'll, you know, be careful about um, social distancing and avoiding crowds, you know, all the things that we learned from the past uh, that reduce your risk of um, getting infected. So very, very important to uh, let the, the people know uh, when there's a change in uh, the numbers of, of infections and, and hospitalizations and, and, and deaths. And I would also, you know, emphasize again what uh, Cam just said about uh, the uh, home testing and, um, and the testing that's done in the clinics, as well as the uh, drugs that are available to treat COVID. Uh, these mutations aren't affecting any of those things. They're um, the the uh, tests that are uh, available and the drugs that are available are targeting other proteins of the virus uh, where uh, there are some mutations that are occurring in those proteins as well, but so far none of those uh, mutations have affected the drugs and uh, the testing. Thank you both. Um, and uh, Dr. Montefiore, I'd like to follow up on the uh, the testing. I'd, I'd like both your perspectives on this if you want to weigh in. You know, uh, it seems like anecdotally, as cases have risen and everybody knows people that have got COVID, people have had less home tests on hand. How important is it, do you think, that people should keep tests on hand so if they get symptoms that they might have thought was a summer cold, that they do, do test so that they can quarantine, you know, um, if needed? Is it something that people should still make sure they've got a supply of? Yeah, I would highly recommend that they keep a supply on hand. Um, you know, there are a lot of things going around, a lot of respiratory diseases. Uh, it's good to know if it's COVID. Um, we know, you know, how to avoid um, spreading it to other people. Of course, that's true for any respiratory uh, disease. So one could argue, what difference does it make if it's COVID and you know that it's COVID or it's something else because you still want to avoid being in public and being around other people so that they don't get it. Um, but I think it is important to do your own self-diagnosis and, and know whether or not it's COVID because COVID is uh, you know, highly transmissible. We, we can't forget that. Um, and you wanna be extra careful if you know that you have COVID and avoid being around other people so that they don't get it. I think the other advantage there is that there's treatments. And so if I have if I have the situation of having a respiratory infection, whether it's me who's high risk or my spouse who suddenly falls sick, um, you know, if I know what I have, I'm going to be much more inclined to be to be on the ready to test and or treat someone else who also gets sick. And, and that to me is, is a differentiating factor from other sort of summer colds in that, you know, the potential for this to escalate in certain patients is still greater. But the potential equally for me to have impactful treatments is is, is now really present. So I, I would echo David's comments to say that, you know, having some rapid tests at home is still very helpful. I use them all the time, for example, uh, or I have them with me, sorry, all the time when I travel. Um, you know, that's a situation when I'm going to be mingling with a bunch of different people and sometimes in very intimate and close situations. And and I, I think that's my way of showing sort of respect to the rest of the people in my, in my social circles. Absolutely. Thank you. And on the subject of masking, I'd like to come back to this. We've had another question in the Q&A. Like, at what point would we look at, say, recommending masking indoors, recommending masking in schools? And does the recent increase in cases locally uh, mean that that's something that we should be doing here right now? Yeah, you know, I, I don't I don't personally see that as a likely situation in the near future. Um, I think we now understand enough of the other mitigation efforts that can be made that can that can that have sort of meant the sort of global town or hospital or institution or nationwide recommendations that we had early in 2020 are probably no longer as impactful. That said, I, I do think to David's earlier point, like having visibility of, of case burden makes individuals much more capable of making decisions around masking that are relevant to themselves. You know, do I, I I'll be honest, I took a, I took a flight last week and was I, much more aware of increasing COVID numbers and therefore actually wore a mask on the plane for the first time in a while because I, you know, I I bear witness to the three or fourfold increase in cases that we see here and I didn't want to ruin a trip for myself and family. So I think the individualized decision making is now at everyone's fingertips. And I think that's much more likely, frankly, than sort of en masse decisions to instigate masking much more widespread. You know, we, we, we face that question a little bit in the hospital um, and have done so actually for many years where, you know, we've had masking policies in place that have been ramped up or ramped down along with visitation restrictions 
under certain, you know, more severe winter surges of other viruses this year that COVID will be rolled into that. And so I think you've, you know, we, we, we have a better understanding here of some flex that we can have in terms of reinstigating masking in certain high risk wards, for example, um, reinstigating masking for visitors who are coming into the hospital who we've had a track record of saying sometimes bring COVID with them or our employees. But, you know, then niche situations, that's a high risk hospital um, where, where, you know, our value in not having any transmissions is just that much greater and our patients are that much more at risk. I, I don't personally see the situation and I think, you know, the CDC director has recently elucidated this too, where where a, a sort of much more globalized um, mask requirement would, would ever come to pass. Sure, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Montefiore, I wanted to come back to a point you'd made about how kind of um, immunity can be a passing thing. There's a lot of discussion of herd immunity and the population is vaccinated enough that we have herd immunity. Can you talk a little bit about how that essentially comes and goes because of the mutation of the virus and the important need to remain boosted? Yeah, it, it, we know that the immunity wanes over time. And if you haven't been boosted um, or you know been infected uh, in the past year, that immunity is not very good anymore. Uh, and that's where we are with the majority of people in this country right now. Um, so it's very important that you, you know, continue to get boosted. And because of waning immunity, we're going to continue to see these uh, um, periodic waves of uh, increased infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. And that can be reduced if more people were to get boosted. And we have a very good booster that's going to be available um, hopefully later this month. Um, so um, and, and going back to you know some of the things that Cam was saying about masking, we do uh, know other means of um, um, reducing our risk of uh, uh, spreading the, the virus and, and contracting uh, this particular virus. Um, Masking is something that um, I think would be um, would, would be strongly encouraged if a variant were to emerge that just really evaded the immunity that people have right now and really evaded our vaccines uh, for a period of time until we the vaccines could catch up to that. Um, masking might be something that you know um, should be recommended, but I don't see it as something that uh, I feel strongly should be recommended at this point in time, given the other measures that we can take to protect ourselves and others. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Wolf, I wanted to come back to you on a question that we had um, in the Q&A about um, older people and older patients. We've talked about some of the, the regular precautions people should make and about getting boosted. As an older person, I mean, people, uh, as this particular questioner asked, maybe elderly members of Congress or even a president, how should people who are just um, uh, on the older side of the spectrum be thinking about this? Should they be thinking about this any more differently or taking any more precautions, even absent other kind of um, comorbidities comor or other conditions they might have? Yeah, it's a great question. And heaven forbid I call any of our congressional members older than they ought to be for their roles. But the um, yes, I think they absolutely need to be viewing their own situation as different. And here's, here's the reason, well, here's the twofold reason why. You know, number one, it is generally true that the older we get, the more we have accumulated some comorbidities that make the risk of severe COVID greater. That's the first issue. Not to mention the fact that many of our older adults often now live in communal living situations where, unfortunately, we've had great experience of COVID really transmitting very liberally, for example, through nursing homes and and, uh, and rehab centers. So I think there's there's a there's both an increased disease risk and an increased transmission risk in certain living situations that we cannot underestimate. Separately to that, even for that individual who's you know on the surface of it healthy, we all go through as we age, sadly, a process of what's called immunosenescence, which is the sort of the stagnation, for want of a better word, of, of our immune system, the forgetfulness of our immune system when it comes to remembering things that we were previously um, capable of fighting off and capable of having good immunity to. So where that translates to is it translates to poorer and less long-lasting immunity against things like COVID. We're true when we respond to a vaccine, true when we try and develop immunity from actually seeing the real infection. So older adults have that uh, sort of magnified, both in terms of generally having a higher risk, generally being in situations where transmission can be more liberal, but also um, uh, liberal with a little L, 
but also being in a situation where their immunity and the, and the sort of durability of their immune system is, is, is down. So how do you respond to that um, in flu season? We respond to that now um, in a very standardized way by recognizing that older adults, in fact, need a, a greater stimulus with their flu shot. We have a high dose flu shot now recommended preferentially for anyone over the age of 65 to counter that. Um, this year, we'll have an RSV vaccine recognizing increased risk and, and poorer immunity in older adults over 60. COVID's going to be the same. You know, I, I have a much more compelling argument with, um, or discussion, I should say, with patients who are older adults in my clinics who, um, about COVID and about their individualized risk. And, I, you know, it is a more compelling argument to me that someone who's 75, for example, not only takes their vaccine when it becomes available in the next month, but also has available rapid tests and sort of a plan to say, hey, here's, here's how I'd go about getting an antiviral, heaven forbid I, I turn positive. And that, again, it's, it's, it's a mixture there about risk, underlying comorbidities that many adults still have, but also um, an, an irrefutable age-related um, sort of diminution of their immune system. Sure, thank you. Um, we're going to wrap this up uh, shortly, but before I come to you both for closing comments, Dr. Wolf, I wanted to come back to something you mentioned uh, in the beginning about immunosuppressed patients. And as long as this is circulating and then there are still people that are getting hospitalized, and obviously the immunosuppressed are often not able to get the vaccine or it, it won't work for them, are they just basically at the mercy of everybody else that's getting COVID and just going to have to remain extra, extra careful for as long as this thing is in circulation? Is just that just a harsh reality of the situation? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. We certainly have lots of other um, tools that are still up our sleeve. So, for a start, immunosuppression is a broad umbrella that encompasses many different um, types of patients, and for the most part, most of those patients will respond partially, at least, to vaccines. Many of them may require more vaccination to get the same response that someone who is healthy. But that, that there's different ways that your immune system can adapt to a vaccine and learn from it or, or native infection from that matter. So it doesn't take away the desire to vaccinate someone. In fact, it enhances it. Um, you know, we have had different antiviral strategies for people who are infected. That's now well established. And there's still a lot of work going on to um, rebuild our armamentarium of antibody defense. You know, if you, if you truly can't make a response to a vaccine, can I give you some antibodies? You know, we've, we, we, we remember the days two years ago when we would give a lot of patients a drug called Evyashield, for example, as a preventative monoclonal antibody. Ongoing trials are continuing to try and develop um, antibodies that are actually susceptible to, uh, that are responsive to current variants. We're not there yet. But I think those sorts of horizons are, are, are important developments that are still going to keep going for immunosuppressed individuals. Not apart from the fact we simply need to be continuing to message those folks to say, hey, maybe mitigation strategies are actually more important for you and your surrounding family. For example, when I sit in the room with a lung transplanted patient um, of mine yesterday, actually my most important conversation was to all of their family members to influence their decision about vaccination in order to prevent their loved one from getting sick. So there's lots of different strategies we can do there. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we're about to wrap this up. Um, Dr. Montefiore, I just wanted to come back to you for any closing thoughts on you know, what you think the appropriate level of concern among the public should be right now. Obviously people shouldn't be panicking, but what are the things you, people, you want people to bear in mind? Get boosted, keep tests on hand, any kind of last minute public health advice. Well, I think we covered quite a bit. Um, you know, one of the main messages with the recent data is that the BA2.86 variant that we've been hearing a lot about in the news and people were getting concerned about because scientists were initially concerned about um, those concerns have sort of uh, settled down now that we have some real data and that variant doesn't look nearly as bad as um, um, scientists feared it was going to be. It's also interesting that we, you know, continue to have these uh, the, this evolution of the virus and the virus acquiring mutations in regions that could be very critical for how well the vaccines will continue to work. And yet the vaccines are continuing to work and the updated vaccines are very important uh, in that regard to uh, assure that uh, people do have adequate immunity to the newer variants that are, are evolving. And so, you know, it's, I'm optimistic uh, right now about the uh, vaccines that are available and uh, the future 
of being able to keep up with variants that arise later on uh, and, and our ability with the vaccine technologies to rapidly catch up to those and continue to boost the immune system in a way that will remain, remain effective against future variants. And hopefully we won't see a variant uh, someday that just completely evades immunity uh, and we have to start all over again building up uh, new immunity to that variant. That's something that we don't know uh, if it will ever happen, but you know we're three and a half years into this now. There's been a lot of immunity in the population for quite a while, and we haven't seen that yet. So I'm somewhat encouraged by that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And Dr. Wolf, any closing uh, pieces of advice or thoughts from you? Yeah, maybe maybe one that I don't think we've covered so far. I think we need to maybe make sure that we level set what the what the aim of a vaccine or aims plural of a vaccine really can be. You know, when we started out on this pathway in early 2021, a vaccine became available and it looked like the preventative efficacy was in the high 90 percent, like no one would get infected. And I think we sort of fell into the trap maybe of thinking that the target should be no infection. And that's a great target, don't get me wrong, but I think we actually have two aims when we vaccinate patients, exactly the same with flu. Number one, does this vaccine substantially reduce the number of infections that are actually occurring? And, you know, the, the, actually the guidance there has been that it has still been very effective, maybe not the 90% that we saw with, with Wuhan strain, but, you know, if, if I can prevent 50% of the infections that would take place, that's an outstanding reduction of the overall community amount of virus. The second thing though is severity. And I think we, you know, this is the hammer home point to me when I'm talking to patients is that even if you happen to get flu, if I get COVID, I beg your pardon, if I can turn what might've been a hospitalizing requiring severity of illness or heaven forbid an ICU requiring severe illness into something that you can manage at home, then that is a success. And I and and that is absolutely the case with flu vaccines. We see the same thing. You know, we 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 are comfortable. I'd love it to be better, but we accept that a, a vaccine prevention of fifty percent of cases is great. But those people also, when they get sick, don't land in my ICU. And I actually think we're starting to see that impact. When I look at these numbers of people who are in the hospital, the proportion of people who land in the ICU continues to fall. And actually, that is to me a more compelling argument. Like even if you're going to get sick, I, I, I want your illness to be manageable. I want it to be mild. I want your ability to transmit this to be less. And I don't want you to land up in my intensive care. Those two goals for vaccines are just as important to me. Reduced, out, re reduced numbers of infection, even for those who get infected, reduced severity. And actually so far, that's exactly what we've seen and continue to see with this. Absolutely. And thank you, uh, Dr. Wolf, for highlighting that. I think we'll call it there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists, David Montefiore and Cameron Wolf, for sharing your perspectives, as always. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu. In the meantime, please get boosted when the time comes. Stay well and look out for the people around you. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, David.